Welcome everyone to another episode of To Debate, our podcast of debates. Uh, I'm one of your hosts, Dirk, and um, as usual, Sebastian looks remarkably relaxed and prepared to me on my screen. Sebastian, how are you doing today? I'm getting ready for this, is it what, 400th debate? What you're getting ready today? now? That's 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 a crazy preparation. Oh, right. I time. think I'm probably tired because I should not have said I'm getting ready. <laughs> I am ready, of course. I am doing fantastically well, as I as I always say. Uh, so, <laughs> are you today, mocking me, uh, Sebastian? Are you what? mocking me? I get the impression you're making fun me? of me. Yeah, I never make fun of you. You're my like like you're my like my role model. <laughs> like, I want to I want to look like you. I want to think like you. I want to dress like you. I I'm just like I want to speak like you. I I'm just I don't I just have no words to say. You know I want what? to play the guitar like you do. I want to have an Iron Man glove and head. You know, <laughs> <laughs> plastered. No, plastered people have a picture wall. in mind. Um, I I applaud your aspiration. Very good plan. Very good plan. See? Yeah. No, I'm, there's no mockery in what I said. Our motion today is we should accept citizens who went to fight with ISIS and got captured back into their home countries. Let's do this. Okay, let's do this. Sebastian goes first and argues for the motion. The reason why we should accept citizens who fought with ISIS back to their home country where they reside is because... The base concept of citizenship comes with rights and obligations. And the right is to live in that country of your citizenship. And that right remains of your act, uh, remains regardless of your actions. And I, it may be surprising, but your actions can lead to prosecution. You can end up in jail, but that doesn't remove the right to live in the country where you're a citizen from. So if we start playing with that, we lose the concept of a citizenship. It starts to become very vague and insecure. It doesn't mean much anymore. The second thing is if we don't try to reintegrate fighters for ISIS, there's a major risk they go underground. So we lose track of them. Uh, they may actually come back to the country without us knowing it. Whereas actually, you know, we can discuss it here. We're, you know, we're not politicians. But you know, if we actually ask them to declare themselves, it doesn't mean they will not end up in jail. Right? If, we, if they actually say, put their hand up, now you may expect that most of them will not put their hands up and say, hey, I want to fight with ISIS. But some of them maybe will will generally think that nothing's going to happen to them. In fact, this is what's currently the case. A lot of the fighters, British fighters, came back to the UK, uh, hundreds of them, and nothing has happened to them. Although I have read online that they're liable for prosecution at the uh, International Crime Court of Justice for major crimes that they've committed over there. Also, as I said, so it's not because you welcome them back that you're not going to jail them. Uh, there's a difference between accepting. It's not about opening your arms and saying, hey, come and hug me. It's about being clear on what a citizenship means. Here is my major point in the last few seconds of my two minutes, is that by show, showing some leniency towards maybe the less guilty fighters, so maybe they end up in jail for a shorter period of time than the most guilty ones, maybe we can reverse the negative image that these fighters had of their home country by saying the Western world is against Islam. Right? If you show um, that we actually welcome them back, even if it's to end up in jail at different jail terms, it will go against the, the rhetoric that they have in saying, oh, the Western world doesn't like them. So this is a, one of the major reasons why I think we should accept citizens back home. Now, it's Dirk's turn. Let's hear his argument. Yeah, risk. You mentioned risk. Risk is a good point. Somebody who walked out of your country and decided to fight against the culture and the nation states that you represent may pose a risk when they come back. So what is saving us from inviting sleepers back to our countries? I mean, right now, right now we, we keep refugees out for fear of getting sleeper cells and terrorists into countries. In case of ISIS fighters, we actually have proof. We know that they've been out and fought and tried to kill Westerners by following a extreme religious doctrine. So... Inviting them back into the country and not even per, um, prosecuting them, as you said, happens right now, for instance, in Great Britain. For me, that feels extremely risky. Now, you mentioned the nation state. There's an argument to be made. If those fighters maybe voluntarily gave up their nation state, 
maybe they are not citizens anymore of those countries when they decide to go out to fight in ISIS against the Western world or to become terrorists, if you will. So, um, yes, you're right. We need to make clear what this distinction is. We need to make sure that uh, we invite or we, we let citizens come back to their home countries. But the question then is, is somebody who go, walks out to fight for ISIS still a citizen of Britain, France, Germany? I'm not so sure about that. The third thing is an example. Imagine you have your parent to a son and that son at some point decides you're an idiot, leaves the house and whenever you walk out of the door, shoots at you. Would you invite that that son uh, a month later when he tells you, oh yeah, I got rid of my weapon, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm totally new now. Would you invite him back into your home and trust that person? I don't think so. And I believe it's a very similar situation with citizens that walk into ISIS fights and then claim to be, uh, claim to have a right to come back just because they've been caught. And now on to Sebastian. Let's hear his rebuttal. So you raise good points. Uh, sleep itself. Yes, it is a risk. And my, my main argument against that is to say, first of all, they exist anyway. So what's the best strategy to try and counter them? And I'm of the opinion that the more visible they are, the more visible the people are, that the easier it is to target them and try to undermine them. If you push people out of, of a country, at least from a superficial legal perspective, nothing actually prevents them from actually going to the country anyway via other means, fake passports, as we have seen with terrorist attacks in Paris, for instance. Uh, where there was some uh, passport sounds uh, found, but it was a Syrian soldier, but it was not a passport of the guy who, got, who blew himself up at the stadium, if I'm not mistaken. So this happens anyway, and I think indeed that people should let them make these terrorists, of, or would-be terrorists, because we don't know if they would actually become terrorists, more visible. Prosecution, I think we would both agree that there should be some form of prosecution. If you go and fight in another country, especially for a terrorist organization, at least recognize as such, there should be something happening to you afterwards at least a police investigation of some kind. Uh, it baffles me that nothing has been happening. The third aspect is, what do we think of making people stateless? Right? Because if we don't allow them back home, basically they don't have anywhere to go. It's very close to removing the citizenship because what's the point of having a citizenship if you can't go back to the country of citizenship? And that poses another problem. We're basically pushing the problem to another country, which is going to have to host them. I mean, they have to be somewhere on the planet. Currently, I think there's about 10 or 12 million people who are stateless. They don't have any citizenship for various reasons. Uh, and the thing is, I think what I know from the statistics from the French fighters, uh, there's that flawed perception that these guys are from, you know, they may ha hold dual citizenships from maybe Algeria, or Morocco, and that's not the case. You know, most of these fighters are, are maybe second generation or third generation immigrants, but who is not a second or third generation immigrant in France anyway? And these guys are French. They were born in France raised in France, and if you take away their citizenship, well, where, where do they go? And Algeria is not, is not going to accept them. They don't recognize them as Algerian citizens. So that's uh, one key aspect um, against, I think, your, your stance. And I want to insist on something else. The thing is, I think uh, there's, it's pointless with these fighters, at least maybe with most of them. And the reason I say uh, the following argument is, an, is a, a, very, a symmetry of what is happening with neo-Nazis, the way you try to de-radicalize de them. Try to show them that there's not another way. You're not going to fight on philosophical grounds. They're not going to accept it, or religious grounds in the case of Islam. But maybe you can show them ways to address the same problem they try to fight in different ways, in nonviolent ways. For instance, if they feel Muslims are discriminated you know, in the UK or France or Germany when they try to find jobs, well, maybe they could do other things like you know, demonstrations. They could run up for elections to change the law and impose fines on employers who discriminate uh, people based on religion. Right? So maybe by showing and having a discussion saying, you know what, you don't have to fight. You can actually do different things. Right? And if you really want to impose a very strict uh, analysis of Islam, then you know, maybe you'll be defeated or not in the, in the election polls. That doesn't work with everyone, though. Some people are true criminals and they would need to go to jail. But maybe for the most, the less guilty ones, it's still possible to de-radicalize uh, them. So that's the reason why I think it's worth having them back home to try and plug them back into society. <laughs> Next up, Dirk. Let's hear it. So let me take a hard stand here. You know what? 
if you do big boy things, it's going to have big boy consequences. And there's something to be said about, oh, you can go to war, join a terrorist organization, try to kill people, and then just come back and be treated fairly. And maybe the society of your former home country even pays for your rehabilitation. So you suggest that we accept people back, then put them in jail to make them, uh, quote unquote, pay for their crimes. And then they are back being regular citizens. And that means not only that this person left the country to fight against us, that person comes back and then we pay for their well-being in a jail. And then afterwards, accept the risk of having somebody who already proved in the past that he or she has a radical mind in our midst. Well, you know what? If they decide to leave for Syria and fight in Syria and then discover that they are not citizens of France, Germany, whatever, what have you anymore, tough luck. I mean, I, I, what, what, why is that our problem? Somebody made a decision. Somebody uh, made a pretty radical decision, tried uh, try to kill people, and there are consequences. And I, I don't see the point in being overly friendly about that. And I, I frankly couldn't care any less if they decide to live in Syria to kill others. Well, then maybe they find a way to become a Syrian citizen or an Algerian citizen or what have you. I really don't care. And this is maybe maybe one one more point. If we capture them, maybe they are subject to prosecution. You know, maybe we, they got to be jailed. But nobody says this has to be in their former home countries. And um, actually, what uh, our interest should be to make uh, make it as hard and as undesirable as possible for people to go down that path. So by being really by taking really a hard stand against people that that go down that path, you may also avoid others to follow the same principles. I mean, you know, educating them on on ways to run for election and change the laws come on get real uh, it's not a lack of education that you can try to run for office that uh, that makes them joining isis it's not that they they value the the the, the chance to change system uh, in a, a long term process that makes them join isis There probably are tons of motivations not all of them are religious but some may even be religious in the end, it's a decision people make and decisions have consequences and consequences sometimes suck and are hard and are sometimes even inhuman. So was the decision to shoot others. Um, so I'm sorry, I maintain my position. Um, no, we don't have to accept them back. And I think maybe we even shouldn't. Final statements. Sebastian goes first. I think you're denying the very concept of citizenship. Yes, it is the, their right to go back home. And yes, we should pay for that. That's the whole point of a, of a nation state. And it's costly for society, but that's the whole point of having a society organized. And I think we should be forgiving. Now, I say forgiving to an extent. Right? If you're criminal of genocide, uh, if you're guilty of genocide, if you're guilty of having raped women, uh, you're not, we're not going to forgive and just forget that it happened. But if you want to fight and you know maybe kill the Syrian soldier as part of a uh, of, of the war, maybe your jail sentence will be reduced because it's not as bad as raping women. I don't know. I'm not a lawyer here. My point is, we can't just say it's black and white. Not everyone is the same. You have soldiers, young people, teenagers who were just malleable. They just got influenced, and I think we have to be forgiving. And everyone makes mistakes. These are big mistakes. Yes, there are big mistakes. You say Syria or Jerry may wel welcome them, but no. I mean, they recognize ISIS as a terrorist organization. Nobody's going to welcome them anyway. They're, they're unwelcome everywhere. And that's the problem. We risk feeding the same message, which is wrong, by the way. It's not the actual what's happening. But the message which would look like, oh, we refuse all Muslims. right? Uh, and I think indeed there are, we could show the less, the most influenced, influenced, how do you say, the people who get the most easily influenced, we could show them there are alternative ways. It could be elections, but it could be other ways, other things to make them feel that they can have a, a voice and a say in how society works, wherever they live, wherever they, they're a citizen from. So I think, yes, it's acceptable, and we should accept them back home. Now, they may end up in jail, but that's how we're organized as a society. Dirk. Let's make a little thought experiment. If you would do a survey, a poll, 
and you go to the UK because that was your initial example of uh, where a, a country that apparently right now has a lot of ex-ISIS fighters and it's not doing much about it. If you go to that country and you make a poll among the citizens who have not been ISIS fighters and ask them how to proceed with these returning ISIS fighters, what would you expect would the verdict be? Probably they, they suggest to reinstate the death penalty or throw them out of the country or build a jail somewhere in the Middle East on some uh, rock that was a formerly Great Britain colony and now is just a rock with a jail on top of it. Something like that. So the concept of citizenship is nice and usually it works and is important, but that's not a necessary requirement to organize our society and there are exceptions to every rule. So I maintain my position. No, we shouldn't accept them back into their home countries. The, the maximum that I would uh, be willing to follow is let's put them in jail on some rock somewhere close to where they decided to go to. Thank you for listening. Again, same thing. Tell us what you thought of this debate. We may not have covered all the arguments in favor or against the motion. You can go to our website, our Facebook page. You can email us. Uh, don't email us plans to, you know, terrorist plans. I mean, we don't accept those, but we do accept, you know, rational debates um, on the topic. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you. It was fun. Cheers. Bye-bye. Bye. Are you saying I'm, I have the difficult topics, the, the difficult side? Well, the good thing I, is I, you flipped the coins, so I, I, I think you, it, it is a motion where you can make a good case, I believe, for both sides. I think tree. so. I, and maybe listen, even every time, I, every time I have like a side which I don't like, I say, oh shit. And then when I think about it, I actually start to like my side. So there may be some, I don't know, just like, is it called side bias? Is like a new psychological bias? No, but uh, there are a couple of things. First off, most of our motions are actually complex enough so you can make good cases for both sides. Then the other thing is um, if you... Like homeopathy? When, well, yeah, well, that was an outlier, I would say. <laughs> That's the one you wanted, desperately. <laughs> desperately? No. No, I know, I know. But you were, um, you were passionate about it. I liked it too, don't worry. Uh, but I would not have thought about it. That's my point. Yeah, the, the homeopathy, homeopathy was a hard one because I was the one actually defending the stupid thing. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> my wife's side of the family is actually a little bit uh, more spiritual, to say that. And uh, you find everything in that crowd. So we have a few vaccination skeptics and people who like homeopathy or the so-called natural medicine and they always uh, I, I'm, I'm going to be on a family gathering I believe later this year next year I don't know um, but I expect to have a lot of fun when I say things like there is no alternative medicine there is medicine and not medicine <laughs> I think I think you should listen to the debate should we have diplomatic protocols yeah, exactly. Before you go and see your, your in-laws or your yeah. family. And I, and I also like remind something. myself of the arguments in the debate, whether or not it's okay to have a preemptive strike, because maybe... <laughs> <laughs> see? With todebate.net, you're ready for any circumstance, yeah. right? It's like, it's, it's yeah. The manual for every kind of situation in life. <laughs> because you have both sides, you have everything. Like, like war, like family, like medicine. Yeah. Like, Great. That's very good. Um, I'm actually half serious. <laughs> and I, I have the same thing too. I, I find myself in debates as well where I think like, oh, I debated that. But the, <laughs> the fun thing is sometimes I'm not sure which side I was on. <laughs> exactly. That's exactly what's happening to me. I don't remember. I'm like, Shh. like, I don't know what is my opinion anymore. Like, it can be confused me because I'm forced to select a side. I'm defending like tooth and nail. Yeah. Until I, I know I'm going to win, and then, I, and then I forget. And I guess you have the final word. I can't say anything. Yes. Well, um, I'm burning with... <laughs> <laughs> that, that's a crappy thing. With theory, wanting right? to say the survey thing. That's, I don't know which fallacy it is, but that <laughs> I really, really don't like as an argument. Oh my God, I'm bursting. Because well, indeed, um, your point, if you ask today, 
you know, whether people in France uh, would be in favor of the death penalty, they'd probably say yes. Yeah. Right? And that's the whole point of having, you know, constitutions and the fact that the majority sometimes the, is not. My right. point is something else. My point actually is something else. Um, I'm not saying that this is a good way to handling things, um, but if the one thing that you discovered in Great Britain, probably if that would be uh, advertised, there would be outrage. And uh, concepts like citizenship are not a God-given. So they are basically an agreement between people who consider themselves citizens. So the rules, and that you can see that very clearly um, if you look at the, the rules that govern how you become a citizen. In some countries, it's the place of birth that gives you citizenships. In other countries, you have to earn the citizenship and, and these, these things. So it is an agreement between the existing citizens. And my argument actually is not, hey, let's ask the people if they are okay with killing ISIS fighters. Actually, my argument is, it's a... If it's an agreement between citizens, I'm pretty sure that citizens would disagree with welcoming back ISIS fighters. <laughs> Fair enough. So tell us, our dear listeners, tell us, what should we do with those fighters? Especially considering now ISIS is almost dead, by the way. I don't know if you followed the news recently. So they're pretty much, uh, it's probably been pretty much over. So it's going to be actually question. Like the question we debated today is going to be the question that our leaders in various democracies are going to be faced with. What do they do? Yeah, there are, there are multiple things. One thing is um, actually the majority of ISIS fighters are citizens in countries around that region. And those, those countries have the same question. What is actually the policy in the States for these things? I mean, they have... That, that, by the way, is also interesting. They, they do have that idea of a private security company, and those are practically people that are allowed to fight outside the United States. So you can be a member of a private army, if you will. And um, that private army, sometimes even employed, uh, sometimes even paid by the US government, is fighting wars in foreign countries. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> You're exposing yourself again. I, I, I don't know why no, you keep doing that. No, I'm showing my bullet wounds. I know exactly what you're talking about. I, do, I just don't want to say it you know, on the on the podcast. But if you have that concept, if you have, if you if you say you you have um, you have that idea in your in your society and in your legal system that people are oh. free to fight for money yeah. outside your own country, that should include things like ISIS. You decide. Yeah. So how is it if I'm I an guess, American citizen be, go somewhere? It could, be it could be precluded if the United States or the country which announced that says you can't be on that side because it's it's a terrorist organization. Yeah, and then they oh. put you into Guantanamo, which is a extra legal place anyway. And this is exactly basically the United States are doing what I was uh, um, um, discussing here. Basically, the United States would would pick you up. Um, would decide that you are a member of a terrorist organization and they would deport you to Guantanamo. And then you're on that island with no rights. That's basically what they do. Or they I keep you I in a CIA prison somewhere in the Middle East. Would you mind when you edit the podcast to remove any mention of Guantanamo, the US, and Islam, <laughs> and Syria, and ISIS? <laughs> like these are... <laughs> because I'm kind of worried. <laughs> <laughs> you, mean, uh, you mean the fact that we are talking through an internet connection about Guantanamo, ISIS, terrorism, bombing, all these things. Isn't it end-to-end -end encrypted? Uh, yeah, end -end but, uh, but uh, I, I kind of assume that... End-to-end -end encrypted through the NSA servers. Yeah, right? probably. Probably. Should we say hello to the NSA yeah. agents hey. listening to us? Hi. Uh, give us five stars <laughs> on iTunes, please. <laughs> <laughs> And I'll give you all the passwords to, to, to Dirk's devices at the, at the nah, airport. They, you don't have to give them that. They have them. Oh, okay. <laughs> I have no doubts about that. <laughs>